if you were watching CNN yesterday. It's an interesting, dangerous time, and I think that you should pay attention to the credentials of anybody who's giving you any information. So having said that, and it's all about being on time. <laughs> <laughs> Showing and giving respect. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here, here, here's, here's my shit, which I'll talk over. Uh, I was in the band with Johnny Rotten for five years called Public Image Limited. We did, uh, here there he is, now he sells butter for country life English butter. <laughs> I met Dick Clark in 1981. That's how you think, that's how fucking old I am, right? Um, what with Nine Inch and they had like a whole video. Uh, on the Grammy Award winning track Wish. Uh, I have a record, uh, so I work with Ministry, Killing Joe, Pill, blah, blah, blah. Started the band Pig Face. I have a record label that's 21 years old. We've released about 400 CDs in the last 21 years. I have a music publishing company that controls 3,000 <coughs> songs. My label controls 10,000. So if you know anything about song placement, licensing, I can license 3,000 songs because I own them on both sides of the copyright with more facts in two minutes. That's what that game is all about now. Uh, I have a recording studio. I've been to China twice, signed a bunch of bands, um, made a documentary which just won an award. Yeah, I'm, now I'm like, well, uh, I've uh, got a fly on my suit. Wrote a book called Tell Smart. Started teaching by accident six and a half years ago. Wrote a book called Tell Smart, which has been in the top 25 Amazon Music Business for the last two and a half years. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of people in the book. And now I like to do this at this point. Well, before you can see that that graph was just meaningless crap, I changed the slides, right? Um, <laughs> I just turned 50 years old. I was 50 last year. Um, I've got four kids, four boys. Uh, from 18 months to 14 years, and I live in Chicago. And I'm a bad DJ. Not a good bad, I'm a, I'm a bad bad. I'm a bad DJ. Um, if you like, I'm an entrepreneurial plate spinner. That's what I do, I'm spinning a bunch of plates. Yes, that's my life. Do, do you guys want to come in here? I don't want to be one of those guys who's like, yeah, come on down the front, but there's some of these things over here. You can say that, that's fine. So, strategies. Before we start with strategies, so yeah, it's about being on fucking time. <laughs> Here today. I don't mean necessarily musical rock stars, I mean <coughs> metaphorical rock stars. Advertising rock stars. Are there any rock stars here today? Woo! <laughs> can, we, can we try that again? Can we rewind the tape, right? Hey! <laughs> here today. Yeah. That's great because Jimmy John Sandwich Shop <laughs> Yeah, a little bit harsh. Why do I do that? Well, I think partly I'm just a prick. <laughs> It kind of illustrates that the world is changing. When I was a kid, there was like 50 rock stars, and if they're still alive, they're still rock stars now, right? But now, obviously, the idea of a regular rock star has changed. Everybody's a producer, everybody's a DJ. I think this business is participatory in every sense. Um, people, well, this isn't a, this isn't a cell phone. But people are doing remixes on their cell phones. What does that sound like? It's just got to sound like absolute pants, right? <laughs> but that's not the 
point. It's their own personal, shitty, fucked up, no frequency response below 200, no bass guitar, unfortunately, on the cell phone remix crap. It's their shitty remix that they can inflict on their 25 to 50 Facebook friends. <laughs> That's the world now, and a personal attachment to shit. Uh, but everything's changing all the time. Things just keep changing at a very, um, an increasingly fast pace. Who's my spacing? Oh, yeah. Oh, Tom. Boo. If you say my space, get him the fuck out of here. <laughs> <laughs> we've been a little bit silly to ignore my space. There's six million bands still on there hoping for a break. So, yeah, it's all about. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, but who's born springing? Yeah. <laughs> so Facebook is now, you know, Google's getting involved in Google Buzz, because now like it's like the Beatles versus the Rolling Stones versus the Who. It's like, fuck you, no, fuck you. Listen, how old is MySpace? Six years? How old is Facebook? Five years? Maybe? It's, it's insane, isn't it? Right? Trying to keep up with this stuff. Uh, who's, who's running several Twitter accounts? <laughs> Great album. Yeah, I love the hi hat. Fantastic saxophone solo. Yeah, it's just you. What a great piece of branding that is. That's a new uh, music service in Norway. And it's all going to be all about local Norwegian. What are we going to call it? Wimp. No. Yeah, we call it. It's like a week old, and of course it's just going to. Be. Uh, I don't know what two mo mobile is doing. With it. Anybody have a YouTube account? Are you using YouTube? Nobody's using YouTube. You know about two mobile? Well, write it down and Google it. It's, you can upload to like 25 video sites. In the same time, it takes you to upload to YouTube. <coughs> it just does. So it's a lot of that. It's a world of that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, speaking of changes, anybody heard about this cellar band? Two years old. I think I called it the week after they started cellar band. This is going nowhere very quickly. They made a bunch of money and they declared bankruptcy. So. If you didn't realize, the beginning of my thing is all over the place. Uh, Denny's is supporting bands on the road. Do you know about that? <laughs> no. Right, so you take your fans to Denny's after a concert, <laughs> eat some food, hold it down long enough to take a photograph, <laughs> <laughs> and they'll send you coupons for food. I think, this is great. Uh, then I found out there was actually coupons for food Denny's. So, uh, Motel 6 are giving bands rooms. Somebody downstairs did a Motel 6 thing, mess around with Motel 6 branding. Yeah, they're giving bands hotel rooms. Right? So I don't have to tell you guys that brands want to get involved with bands. It's just a powerful thing. So I'm on the phone with the guy in charge of the branding of the bands. They're giving rooms to a country western band, a rock band, and a punk band. And so, of course, I'm trying to leverage a deal for myself, which, bizarrely, if I win, I'll get rooms at Motel 6, which is like, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, he says to me, we're quite concerned that the punk band might trash the rooms. <laughs> and I think I blew my relationship with Motel 6, and I'm like, well, how much fucking damage could they do? <laughs> <laughs> if, they track, if they drive a truck through the room, what is it? Like?
think that's what my hotel suits to you began. There's a problem. Uh, Procter & Gamble started a record label. Does anybody know what it's called? I need to know what it's called. I don't know what it's called. But as I'm very fond of saying, it's great to see another white powder entering the music <laughs> <laughs> So the only constant thing is change. Um, and just a little asterisk, side note, I, mean, I think change is, is forward moving. You know, I, I do like panel events sometimes. There's always some old music business fuckhead on one of these panels. Would tell your congressman to shut up. <laughs> it's gone. All of that stuff is out the back. We're not rolling things back to the way they used to be. We're rolling things forwards. That's the deal. Um, and that, that's, that's a Roman quote. That's Heraclitus. Right? So if he was around today, his head would explode. Um, this is another quote that I like. This is Bruce Mao. He has an incomplete manifesto up on the web. It's a great thing to Google and look at. He says uh, stuff like this. Safety is in the middle of the raging river uh, where the water is running fastest and deepest. You'd think you know, the, the, the human uh, condition, you, you want to cling to the banks. That seems like it's the safest place. But in entrepreneurial times, which is this, the safest place to be is right in the middle of the ship. That's the safest place to be. Um, I'm trying to find like a mosh pit equivalent, you know, to do the music thing. And I asked an audience in California, so what's the safest part of the mosh pit? And this guy, the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> um, another Bruce quote that I like, uh, Bruce Lee, you have to make stepping stones out of stumbling blocks. Right? Which, he didn't just say that, he actually did it, because he broke his back. And instead of lying in a hospital, but if it was me, if I was Bruce Lee and I broke my back, I'd just be lying in hospital going, oh, f fuck, oh, fucking Bruce Lee, <laughs> fuck, morphine, fuck. <laughs> but he wrote a book, and I just saved you $20, because the, pretty much the only good part of the book is that. <laughs> so, yeah, anybody who wants to Google ADD, there's a picture of me giving this lecture. <laughs> <laughs> strategies. Let's talk about some strategies. Strategy number one would be... <laughs> Bands don't have strategies, they have blurry dice hanging from the ring of the They don't even have a map. I know agents who don't have maps. They right? have a strategy. Strategy number two! Get the fuck out of bed! <laughs> That's me speaking indirectly to my 14 year old son. Look, it's not just me telling this in, it's part of my lecture. You know, it's easy for me to say because I have an 18 month old kid and a five year old kid. I'm up at four o'clock anyway, like somebody's kicking me in the face or puking on me. It's probably the same for many of you. But, but if you're up at five and your friends get up at ten, well, you're five hours ahead of the game or 35 hours a week ahead of them, or 140 hours a month. That's like a secret weapon. How easy is that? <laughs> Difficult at first, it gets easier. Um, yeah, this is for bands, really. I don't know how it would apply. Well, maybe it would apply to you guys, pitching stuff and whatever. Um, it seems strange to me that most bands will strive for a perfect rehearsal situation. Everything's and I'll do a great rehearsal. Well, of fucking course you did a great rehearsal in your perfect situation. What bands should require, and I think I might set this up because it would be a really great thing to do, is a rehearsal where everything goes wrong. 
Like, well, I was in that room with the glass, the CQ. I want the room like that where I can turn the microphones off, make the guitar explode. <laughs> Please radio over the monitor system. You know? That's what you should practice in those situations. You practice for catastrophe and you will triumph. Right? Because Murphy's Law tells us it's, it's going to happen. So they train police horses in England to control soccer fans. They have them run the gauntlet of crazy soccer fans screaming with the noise making things, spitting at them. So when it actually happens, they're just like, yeah, fuck you. <laughs> I love this quote. Never take your country to war unless you're sure of the outcome. <laughs> I don't know what band that guy was in. <laughs> yeah, uh, Facebook, Facebook. But when I read that, I thought, yeah, easy to say, Sonny. Difficult to do. But in this, in this entrepreneurial climate, in this economy, on this planet, you have to do that. And I've got some, I have some ways throughout this that maybe we'll get to some. Stop blaming anybody for anything. Take responsibility for everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> Emphatic underlining the most. Here's the thing, if, if you're a band and you show up at a club called Bogarts in Cincinnati, it's a very dangerous place to be because it holds a thousand people and it only looks full when there's 960 people in there. You can't skate through with 300 people and a few tables and some people moving around quickly to appear to be more. But you can stand on the stage on a Tuesday night and it might legitimately be your agent's fault because this obviously is not the place for you because there are two people in the audience. One of them, because of Murphy's Law, one of those people will be the music critic for the New York Times. What? In Cincinnati, Ohio on Tuesday? Yes. So it doesn't matter who you can blame. You can blame the agent, you can blame your manager because he should have been working with the agent. You can blame your record label if you have one, you don't need one, but if you have one, you can blame that because you didn't send the posters out on time. You can blame the publicist because there's fucking two people here. You can blame the producer of your album because halfway through the recording process, he's like, yeah, can you hear it? <laughs> Track three, backpipes. Wee, <laughs> Now you've got bagpipes on track three. And the guy's <laughs> going to the music critic from the New York Times. Some fuckhead in a kilt. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter who you can legitimately blame for any of this stuff because you're standing on stage and the only thing you'll be able to hear, other than the shitty monitors, and you can blame the monitor guy or your tour manager for that, mm -hmm. is the sound of your career crumpling up into a ball, rolling off the front of the stage, bursting into flames, and falling into a shredder. <laughs> so the, the, the only path to take is responsibility for all of it. This is your music, this is your fragile ego, your band, your brand. It's paying all of the price right there and there. So you just have to take responsibility. <laughs> the good news is, there's nothing in, in any part of the music business, or I think branding, that's complicated. It's just a shit ton of, of work. That's it. It's not rocket science. Three is the new black. <laughs> How do we feel about giving music away? Good. Are there any musicians in the audience? How do they feel about people musical? Yeah, it's good. It's good. Yeah. We're, okay. we're okay for free. This is, you know, this is the other interesting watershed. <coughs> the MySpace, Facebook. Yeah. No. 
Actually, it's called tweeting. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, giving music away for free is the other interesting watershed. Most musicians have, have come around to this over the last year, um, begrudgingly. And some of them don't understand why they need to do it, but they'll still do it. So let's have a look at a few examples to see where we get to. Uh, Monty Python started giving away everything they've ever done. Any ideas what happened to their revenue streams after they... What was that? Okay. I thought you were going to After they started giving everything away, their revenue streams went up. Does anybody know, expressed as a percentage, how much their revenue streams went up? Huh? 25%? Give me two more. 300. 1,000%. 1,000 per cent, 300? 23,000 per cent. Yeah, never mind that. Do you like the delivery? <laughs> Slow motion. Childhood flashback. Away, and I don't actually advise anybody to give stuff away. Really, you're exchanging stuff for in the music business for information, for an email address and a zip code. That's what you need, so you're not bombarding people in different parts of the country with good information, wrong location. Right? They Monty Python the fuck out of it. They had John Cleese on there going, okay, you cheap bastard. Now go and buy some of that shit, and they made it very easy. Like one button and you accidentally bought some of this shit. <laughs> <coughs> and uh, this screen is fully washable. If anybody wants to come and lick the... <laughs> so, that's just me. Oh. A <laughs> bit of a genius. Um, he started bundling. So you buy a concert ticket, you get a copy of his album. Right? So for a dollar, he's adding $50 of value to the concert ticket. It only cost them a dollar to do that. Pretty good. Then, he did something that I didn't understand. He gave away a copy of his last album to anybody who bought the Daily Mail newspaper in England. So, I'd like to tell you guys about target marketing. This is not target marketing. This is everybody in England who buys the Daily Mail. So my mum and dad <laughs> have got a copy of Prince's album. <laughs> I use that to keep my oxygen machine in there. Perfect. I love that guy, Prince. <laughs> but I thought he lost his mind until uh, somebody filled in the blanks for me. He sold out 26 shows at London's O2 Arena because of all the publicity. It's the same place that Michael Jackson was uh, scheduled to do up 20 shows at. So the conversation between Prince's tour manager and the manager of the hotel in London went something like this. Hello, it's Prince's tour manager here. Uh, we need six more rooms. Prince needs six more rooms. And the manager of the hotel is like, okay, stop. He's not getting the rooms. This guy, Prince, is a sexual predator. And what, is he going to, he needs more rooms so he can bring girls and guys probably back to these rooms. And his tour manager's like, shut up. We need six more rooms. We need somewhere to put all the fucking money! Sex <laughs> on. <laughs> 26 million dollars! Right? What does he care? He's given his album one. 26 million dollars! I like this. This is really interesting stuff. You might want to. There's a book called Biology, B U Y O L O G Y, which has been interesting. Um, but look at what this is. Mathieu Drouin, he manages a French Canadian band called Metro. Very interesting. The stuff we give away the most sells the most. If you think this stuff through, you'll come unstuck. I would think 
it, it would be, we give away these five songs, and these other five songs that we don't give away sell quite well. But that's not what he's saying. The songs they give away the most, then sell the most. So people are buying songs that they don't need to buy because they have them, but maybe they feel like they don't own them. Interesting shit. Turns out the people who download the most music illegally spend 40% more money legally downloading music than anybody else. So the very people who don't really fucking with are the people at the RIA is fucking with. Genius. <laughs> so yeah, free is the new button. Seth Godin calls it the gift economy. Right? Same thing, I like free is the new button. <coughs> Aim low, get high. <laughs> that's, I need like a, a reverb unit for that that's going to kick in. Also, probably a xylophone. <laughs> this has to do with ambition, right? Um, ambition is, is a weird thing. Um, I guess, how do we put 20,000 people in a stadium? I have no fucking clue. No idea. But, if there were two people sitting over there, we could make friends with those two people and introduce them to our band, our music, our brand, whatever it is. Make friends with them today. And then all we need to do is that. 10,000 more times, we've got 20,000 people to put in the stadium. That's it. It's kind of messy. It's a lot of work. It's just a multiplier of a simple, <coughs> simple act that you can do. It's like, have ambition, but if, if you're looking up at that goal of 20,000 people, or whatever your goal is, the problem with doing that is your next step is actually there, isn't it? So you're wandering around looking up, you're going to miss your next step, or trip over it, break your ankle. It's a mess. I was lucky enough to be at the Great Wall of China in 2006. And it's a great like, metaphor for, for, for this, actually. I'm standing there. <laughs> and then I got really hungry. Because this is a Kentucky Fried Chicken at the Great Wall of China. Right? I mean, I said to the guy, this is so wrong on so many extra crispy. <laughs> On the other hand, it's just a pile of bricks. It's an amazingly long, amazing, huge pile of amazingly old bricks. It's just a fucking pile of bricks. So, you can stand off to a distance of any endeavor and go, <laughs> or you can just start your own pile of bricks. And six weeks from now, well, they kind of have a shitty, meaningless pile of bricks. Six or seven months from now, you'll have a fucking wall going. People will come up to you, even your friends will come up to you saying, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> People are like, Great Wall of China, two casinos! <laughs> It's the squeakle. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because people will help you with a ridiculous, insane crusade that doesn't make any sense. They'll be like, you're out of your mind, this is crazy. How can I help? When everything makes perfect sense, it's just a business plan. Who gives a fuck about a business plan? You know, um, I saw, sometimes I'm like banging my head against a wall with some kind of freeze a new black. People get it now, a year ago, it was a fight. Um, I won't get high. My son was sent home from school wearing that shirt. It's okay. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> and it wasn't. Uh, but, <laughs> When I saw, like, Aim Low, Get High philosophy, 
memorialized in a major publication. I cried. One time, no, I cried. A great life isn't. A great life isn't about great huge things. It's about small things that make a big difference. When I saw that in the IKEA catalogue. <laughs> <laughs> any of the qualities you want. <laughs> the table. Speaking of, the, as a father of an 18 month old, that's a fucking death trap. <laughs> uh, this is, this is, there's some good stuff in here. Expand yourself as you expand your fan base. Okay, call for spirituality, whatever. But this is really great. Accumulate diverse skills. Um, I met a guy uh, from Indianapolis, uh, called Squirrel, and he's called Squirrel because his name is like Squirrel. <laughs> Squirrel, let's call him Squirrel. Um, he graduated from the, the audio recording uh, program, public. and he was up for a job as the house engineer at a local recording studio in Indianapolis called the Pop Machine, which is a fantastic name for studio. And he got the job there, not because he was a good engineer, because he is, but he got the job over three other engineers because he had one diverse, different skill. Any wild ideas what that skill might be? Advertising. Huh? Advertising? No. <laughs> Well, that's not a fucking skill. <laughs> Squeakle. Well, look, that's not a fucking skill. But <laughs> right, it's, it's genius. We can't fucking quantify it. Right? The, the skill, the additional skill that got him the job was aquarium management. <laughs> he carried a fish tank. <laughs> Everybody's multitasking, everybody's fucked. Like if you're running a recording studio, I have lava lamps in my studio, lots of small studios have fish tanks. But if they don't have any money, or no one's paying attention, you know, it's a great stress relieving device, unless they're very, uh, dead, stinking, rotting fish. Which actually, this was weird when I did my lecture in Norway, because that's the delicacy there. So like, oh yeah, I'm like, no, it's bad. I'm like, no, rotting fish? No. <laughs> Uh, but when I was in a place called Trondheim, uh, John Flyer, who produced the first Nine Inch Nails album, is a fantastic engineer producer. He screamed out to me to tell me this story, this additional skill. He became one of the busiest engineer producers in New York City, not because he's a great engineer producer, which he is, but because he had a little bit of Japanese. All these bands were coming over from Japan. I'm like, oh, fuck, what are you doing? John Flyer, he can take care of this. He couldn't debate in Japanese. He just had the few essential phrases you need to run a recording session with a band from Japan. Excuse me, since <coughs> uh hit the guitars a little bit out of tune. <coughs> oh, uh, excuse me, uh, I'm actually going to punish your guitarist like that. And then, <laughs> <laughs> very useful phrase, call 911, this asshole's going to the emergency. <coughs> if you want to work with the Rolling Stones, and spend time dealing with the elderly, the incontinent. <laughs> <laughs> you don't, don't put it on page one of your resume, but put it on page five, so you can kind of go through it with the management. Yep, query and management, a little bit of Japanese, but oh, you, you've got Don Juan Martin's things, haven't you? <coughs> <laughs> 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 so, hold on a minute. Working with the elderly and the incontinent, that shouldn't be on there. But you can have this like subtext. Yeah, for sure. The manager can say, no, there's no there's no need for those skills in in this organization. Yes, they're fucking. Insane. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I like to think about, uh, you know, Flea from the Chili Peppers um, played the bass on some early pig face song. And I wondered, maybe he'd fly out to Chicago and we'd rehearse a new project, you know. We'd rehearse like 10 days and then we'd drive and gig our way back to a big final show in Los Angeles. And we get in the van, furry guys, here we go, put the map, yes. All right, Martin Atkins and Flea, Flea and Martin Atkins. Drums and bass, bass and drums. Look out, look out California. Look out. Hey, Flea, can you, uh, can you fix the map? I want a bass player who can fix the van. I want a keyboard player who can screen print. I want a guitarist who can shoot a little bit of video, throw it into iMovie, upload it to Eventbrite, sell a bunch of tickets, to take care of the web shit. I want a lead singer who can fuck the world. <laughs> multiple skills because there's no such thing as job security. There's no job security anywhere. The only security is here in your body. <laughs> I mean, let's look, let's look at a couple of, hey, what do you, sir? What do you, what do you do, sir? I'm an American fighter pilot. Not anymore, you're not. We've got unmanned drones and a bunch of kids with Xbox controllers. Flying us. Bye. See ya. Like the outfit. <laughs> and what do you do, sir? I'm an astronaut. No, you're not. <laughs> but there is an opening at Jimmy John's. <laughs> so that's something that I, I pitch pretty strongly, you know. Um, I have a diversified skill set, I think. PowerPoint Ninja. <laughs> it's a time for multitasking. It's that, it's jazz hands. It's jazz hands time. The great thing about acquiring multiple skills is you can present yourself as someone who's acquired the skill of acquiring skills. Right? So if I need someone who speaks Chinese, can repair the moped I've crazily chosen to go around China and record that, and I don't know, make paninis, yes I don't know, crazy panini fetish, no. <laughs> and you present yourself and you've got a little bit of Yugoslavian, you can repair a vehicle, not a moped, and you can make croissants. Fucking well, alright. Your head and shoulders are someone who can only just do one thing. You present yourself as someone who can gain knowledge, right? That's, that's what it's about. And when the, if you just choose one skill, when that skill starts to circle the ball, what do you do, sir? Cassette tape, manufacturing. <laughs> Although it's kind of coming back, but yeah, not soon enough for those. Um, if you just have one skill and it starts to circle the ball, you're going to freak out. If you have 10 skills and three of those skills start to disappear overnight, you still have seven skills and you'll have the skill of acquiring skills to fall back on. Yes. So, it's something I tell musicians, you, know, you don't have to be amazing at any of this stuff. John Fryer isn't amazing at Japanese, he just has a, like an afternoon's worth of phrases that he wrote down on the back of a sandwich box, probably. But you just have to be good enough. And, and that's an interesting variable. If you want to play sitar in Oklahoma City, I think you can just turn up and go, Julian, <laughs> with a bit of panache, right? And down, right? And people go, yeah, fucking great sitar. <laughs> 
go to Delhi, New Delhi, India, someone will stab you. Right? <laughs> There's a sliding scale, just be good enough. So, uh, maybe you've seen those amazing guitar techs at the side of the stage with Christmas tree lights, incense, eight hard drives so they don't miss a, a gigabyte of uploaded pornography anywhere in the world. <laughs> A blender for the margaritas and the tube, right? Is that the amazing guitar tech we want to take to Brazil for our heavy metal festival? Or do we want a mediocre guitar tech who can also say, Onde posso encontrar novos tubos para o amplificador guitaristas? Yeah, we want that guy. We need some new tubes for the guitar amp. The amazing guy with the incense and the blender is just like, can't help us in that situation. It's a time for a diversified skill set. So if you don't have one, get one. Um, we were talk, I was talking to a couple of students earlier upstairs uh, about paths to things that you want. And it isn't usually in a straight line. Right? It's, it's by a circuitous route that you wouldn't expect. So just start doing stuff. Um, we teach a class, I have a small occasional school in Chicago called Revolution Number 3. We teach a class in Xbox modification, Xbox controller modification. Anybody have a modded Xbox controller? <coughs> cool shit, right? The, the thing that I like about it, um, it's the idea of lifting the lid on a Microsoft product and rewiring it. Gives me hope that we can do the same thing uh, to our own brains. But, it's, it's just a door opening device. That's all it is. You can't knock on Slipknot's tour bus door. Hello? Slipknot? I made a mask. <laughs> you knock on Slipknot's door, yeah, I, I modify Xbox controller and say, they'll kidnap you. It's just a door opening device. You can't walk up to the door that you want to walk through, knock on it and hope to enter. You need to tunnel underneath the door. You need to steal a hot air balloon, make sure there aren't any children in it. <laughs> Parachute down on the other side of the door. FedEx yourself. Disguise yourself as a pizza. Delivery. <laughs> Don't get in a garbage bag because then they'll, they'll take you away from the door. Um, set fire to the door. What a punk rock thing to say there. Uh, no, actually, get a fire extinguisher. Make sure you have a fire extinguisher. Then set fire to the door. Fucking set fire to it. And then let it catch. And then kick your way in. <laughs> Hi! <laughs> I just saved this building. <laughs> Possibly your life. It's my resume. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> but that's how you do it. So we're hacking. You take, is that a question? Yeah. Um... I was looking at a blind brand center, and I was wondering if I should try that same technique. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> well, I, I do whatever it takes. Johnny Rock said fuck on national television, and now he's the spokesperson for country life English butter. <laughs> that could be you. <laughs> um, we're just... We're, we're, Absorbing ideas, we're, we're, we're retooling, we're hacking. Um, the, the design of the iPod isn't inspired by a 1960s radio. It's a fucking Xerox of a 1960s radio. I just absorb all this stuff. Here's a great hack. Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. <laughs> then we have this. Yeah, it's shit, isn't it? It's a great cover. It's a fantastic airport fucking. I bought it at the airport, and before I realized I wanted a refund, I was... <laughs> so, um, we're absorbing all of these ideas, and then maybe changing the context. 
So you're familiar with radio and it's pay what you can, pay what you feel idea, right? A restaurant owner in London just took that idea. And you have to pay for the alcohol, but you pay what you feel, you pay what you can for the food. People are like, this guy is a genius. No, he's not. He's just taking radio that idea and taking it into the world of restaurants, right? Like, free is the new black, right? I've taken, I've taken Radiohead's idea, and I brought my book with me, but if you don't have any money for my book, it's all right. I've got a, an e-book download code. If you have some money, give me some. If you don't, take one. I'd rather start a relationship with every one of you than not start it over some money for a This guy just took Radiohead's force, and just like I did, pay what you can, and that's my pay what you can can. Yeah. <laughs> so all we're doing, we're just eating all of these crayons, or everybody else's day glow, multicolored crayons, and digesting them and seeing what we, what we poop out. <laughs> Jamaican Bob, so I was just in Norway watching the Winter Olympics. Jamaican Bob something. What a great way of changing the context. You can't, that, that's not newsworthy. So we started a bobsled team. Okay, yeah, fuck off. <laughs> but we're from Jamaica. Oh my god, that's a Disney movie. <laughs> One person go, cool running. <laughs> and I don't want to pick on one person, but when a hundred people go, cool running. Sliding on my favorite movie, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> so. We're now monetizing the space around the thing we used to sell. I don't know what we used to sell in the music business. I think it was always buy and relationships and connectedness or perceived connectedness in the old days. Um, now we have to monetize all the stuff around the things we used to sell. So I'll advise bands. You must have at least one t-shirt. You need to have two t-shirts. The question has to be, which of these shirts are you going to buy? Which is a very different question than, do you want to buy a shirt? You don't need the possibility of any no answers, right? You need to have a smorgasbord, sorry, I was just thinking that, of things for people to buy. You need your amazing studio album, the demos from your studio album, the acoustic album, five live albums, the fake live in Germany album. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like T-shirt. Come on, you know. If you don't know the names of any cities in Germany, throw a fucking typewriter down the stairs and I guarantee you. <laughs> <laughs> We made a terrible mistake. No, you know what we didn't know, you're still fine. We caught all those. Put them on a CD. People will buy that CD. I will buy it, even if I don't know the name of your band. And then that guitarist will show up at your show with a big placard and a t shirt that says, I fucking started this band and they fired me and illegally recorded my phone messages and all I got was this lousy shirt. Steal that shirt from him or bootleg that shirt and sell that. <laughs> And when somebody comes up to the merchandise booth and says, I fucking love this band, but I have everything. I know you, I know you didn't go to Germany, but I bought that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I've got all the guitarist tapes, that's fantastic. I've got several of those are my friends. But all the downers got everything. Then fucking make something up. It's not just about making money, it's about continuing the relationship. So you can just think on your feet and go, you've got everything. Do you have the recipe book? <laughs> <laughs> huh? Yeah, oh man. Because to
to me, we cook for each other while we were making the album. And if you listen to the album without the recipe, yeah, you're not really <laughs> How much is it? Fifty dollars, let me let me go in the dressing room and make one. <laughs> or it's free. And insert difficult to find ingredients into the recipes. So maybe your fan club on the fourth of April will have a special dinner evening. We're going to do recipe number four, track number four. It's called four, 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 four. And they can Facebook the fuck out of it. <laughs> and here we go. We can start chopping. I'm, I'm working on like another drug joke there. <laughs> and, then, and then they start chopping the, it's not working. It's not working. But ins insert drug joke here. <laughs> So they start, there's a house full of people, where it's four, 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 maybe there's a t-shirt. Here we go, chopping the vegetables now, not the drugs, as previously mentioned. <laughs> Olive oil, yeah, salt, yeah, pepper, yeah, a little bit of white wine, yeah. Uh, onions, yeah, garlic, yeah, saffron, what? <laughs> saffron, the most expensive spice in the world. <laughs> that on a Tuesday, I think there's some on the band's website. Oh, how much do you need? Five pounds. Five pounds! <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. I accidentally stumbled on the new deal, right? Give everything away for free and become a saffron dealer. <laughs> they call me Mallow Yellow. <laughs> Uh, make 3D decisions. Those are my three colors. <laughs> Data-driven decisions. You can't always use the data, but you need to be aware of it, even if you decide not to apply it. Be aware of it, right? Um, this is the 100 largest markets across the US. I wondered how many of them were west of the line from Minneapolis down to Texas. 50. I wish someone had shown me this map 25 years ago. From Chicago, it's 1,200 miles to Denver, 8 or 900 miles to Salt Lake, 7 or 800 miles to go anywhere else. Express differently. It's exploding transmission, exploding bass player's head. I can't fucking do it anymore. <laughs> exploding lead guitarist underpants from the dubious microwave burrito you bought from the Mormon truck stop. <laughs> <laughs> East of that line, it's a smallpox epidemic of opportunity. <laughs> there's, there's great tips in my book, how to get a better sound, how to be a better opening band. It doesn't matter if you're five hours late. You're quite likely to be ten hours late west of that line. East of that line, you can arrive early. You can meet the local sound guy. Buy him a cappuccino, some Thai food, roll in a joint. That's how you're going to get a good sound. <laughs> if you're in the wrong venue, you can wander around town and find the right venue. You can meet the other bands on the door, start networking. If you haven't sold many tickets, you can go to a Starbucks, a tattoo parlor, a hairdressing salon, a Starbucks, a library, a record store if you can find one, a Starbucks, <laughs> a piercing place, or a Starbucks, and invite all those people to come to your show. And if you have a good show, if you create that magical vibe in a room, and that's all merchandising is really, that's the only function now of, of solid objects in this digital world, is to memorialize that fragile vibe that we create, like incense in a room. If you have a great show, you can stick around afterwards and exchange email addresses, uh, listen to somebody's record culture, hang out, you know, um, touch people's lives and make those friends that you've been friends with for decades. Right? The politicians know that that's how you move your band or your brand forward, is in person, uh, one person at a time, eye contact, human contact. The stuff that vibrates, the energy 
that's what makes a difference. Otherwise, Obama and Hillary would have just launched their MySpace <coughs> campaigns. Here we go. Campaign, presidential campaign. There's the MySpace. Call me in a week. <laughs> but they go and touch people, not always in a good way, but they know <laughs> that's what it's about. It's touching people and it's messy and it's time consuming, but that's the deal. That's the deal. Here's some more data. Um, a lot of bands head to Los Angeles. What are you doing? We're going to LA. You're off. <laughs> this is gas prices across the US. The most expensive gasoline in the country is in California. Population distribution across the US. One reason you don't need to go there. <laughs> There's nobody there. <laughs> Maybe that's why someone stole my laptop. <laughs> <laughs> Quake the old world. <laughs> Technology 101. It's never been more important or easier to stay on top of technology. You know, those of you with a YouTube account, you can look at the Google Analytics. So Google bought YouTube, so all that Google Analytics stuff is in there. You know, you can. Find out where your audience is before you take your country to war, right? But it's never been more important to stay on top of technology. It'll always be on the cover. Is that my phone? Sorry, excuse me. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's changed the context. It's the best dollar I've ever spent. Here's, here's <laughs> my question. I've been at like a hundred airports in the last six months. No one's ever said, yeah, make that work, would you? <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to go to South by Southwest next week, is it? Or the week after? Which is newest Blackberry iPhone fetish world. <laughs> got the invisible. <laughs> and I'm just going to walk around with that. Hello! <laughs> it's Amanda Palmer! Shut the fuck up! <laughs> that's just changing the context. When everybody in the world has the newest phone, <laughs> when everybody in the world is on the internet, <coughs> send a postcard. Right? So what's going to happen? Yeah, hold on a second, there's a knock at the door. Who are you? A postman? What's that? <laughs> Hold on, stay on the line. There's a crazy guy. He's handing me a card with a photograph of a boy pissing into a fountain from Belgium. <laughs> what are you going to do with that postcard? You're going to scan it and twitter the fuck out of it, aren't you? Right? Bam! <coughs> Data driven decisions too. I don't know what this is. Oh, all right. So, those of you with a YouTube account, do you know about Insight? You've got it, right? This is old shit. Many musicians don't know about it. But um, Insight gets you that. This is a few months old. Uh, YouTube is now the second largest search engine, which I'm sure you know. So this stuff is just unbelievable to me. You can find out who's watching your video and on what day. It's pretty stunning. Uh, you can ask it how many people in Norway are looking at a video clip I did with an interview for a Norwegian band called Shiny. Not very many. All right, I'm not going to do another one. My Guar video got like 3,000 hits. This got like not. Pretty stunning. You pour gasoline on the sparks wherever they are. You can use all of these tools. Bandcamp.com is a really elegant <coughs> way to put some music up and let people download it at whatever price they feel like paying. And you capture their email address and their zip code. It's quite elegant. Um, and you don't arbitrarily set out to promote your band or your brand in Florida or all over America. What if your fans are in Canada and Belgium? Find out where your fans are, find out where your audience is before you start the rules in motion. 
It's easy to do. There's a band called Fest One out in California. Um, they put a mixtape up on their website with a Google Analytics widget. They got 1,200 downloads in Beijing. So they called a promoter in Beijing and said, hey, we've got 1,200 downloads. They booked a show in Beijing. Guess what? Did pretty well. Never take your country to war unless you're sure of the outcome. Uh, this little something that might protect you, those of you graduating soon, just a little talisman to protect you, maybe. If you can know and understand that you're totally fucked, and I don't mean, yeah, 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 we're fucked, <laughs> no, understanding your head and your heart that you are totally fucked, then you're not. If you think for a second that you're not, then you so totally are. It's kind of it's beautiful, isn't it? A little circular thing. It's a little bit Disney. A little bit <laughs> Two little ideas bouncing around in a tumble drive with someone's seven foot. Yes. <laughs> if you know that you're fucked, then you're not. If you think that you're not, then you are. It's lovely, but quite heavy. And I can see in a couple of faces what is that in German? They do weiss, that's to the thickness. That's to look the feet. They do blouse, that's to the thickness. This do the <laughs> Can I just point out for a second, I don't know how many people come in here, but we've had a little bit of Japanese, Portuguese, and now German. Where in the world are we going next? Oh, well, that's it. It's fucking down there. Oh, wait, I just want to point. <laughs> that's worth pointing out. I think in the music business, people don't really know what to do. So they've seen successful people be assholes. So they recreate that. Just a bad idea uh, for so many reasons. Um, <coughs> I was, a dr I stopped drinking, but I was a drunken asshole back in the day. Um, and I was particularly nasty to a guy called Kevin Lyman. Anybody know who Kevin Lyman is? Anybody heard of the Warp Tour? Yeah, it's him. So, I mean, I'm fortunate that, you know, um, I'm friends with Kevin, he contributed to my book, and, um, I don't know how things got worked out, but they did. We got into a fight, which is stupid. But look, Murphy's Law means that whoever you're nastiest to will be the person that will close the door on your career. And you won't understand why, because you won't remember being an asshole to somebody that at a certain point you know, is insignificant. It's going to fuck you up. So my little sliding scale rule for this area is, well, don't be an asshole, first of all. But the opposite of that is to be as nice as you possibly can to anybody that you can't think of a single reason to be nice to. That's the rule. And you can make a difference in somebody's life that might end up one week, one year, ten years down the line coming back and helping you. Somebody said, yeah, but what if someone's an asshole? Send them flowers, be nice, buy them a drink. That will fuck them up way more. <laughs> okay, hold on. Fuck. I was just an asshole to that guy who bought me a drink. Don't touch it. Oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> you can have the comic uh, glory of being nice to somebody. You always need to do way more than any sane person would do. The world I live in is 28 hours a day, nine days a week, 52 weeks a minute. It's just it. And so as you're acquiring all of these different skills, one of the other skills you'll acquire is the skill of juggling multiple tasks, not sleeping for days. You know, uh, it's a quite valuable skill to have. There are no economies of scale. Uh, you either get somebody's attention or you don't. If it takes you two weeks and $500 to create one object, that you send to a magazine or a blogger or somebody and it gets a reaction, that money wasn't wasted. You got a result. 
Conversely, if you make 50 press kits at Kinko's and have it smudged and cost $10 and you don't get a reaction, that wasn't a bargain, was it? <coughs> Maybe there was a point, here we are in Richmond, the home of Guar. Anybody know who Guar is? <laughs> Well, maybe 26 years ago, just two guys in a rehearsal room. Here we go. This is great. It's just two of us and the drum machine. We are gua, we are gua, we are This is great. We could, if they manufactured a Prius at this point, we could hold it. We could tour in an electric car before they describe that. <laughs> but, but there's two of us. We could just tour in a car. If we just get one pizza, that's half a pizza each. If we only get paid fifty dollars, it's twenty-five dollars each. We can sleep on someone's floor or with a promoter. This is fantastic. <laughs> we cracked it. Just the two of us. <laughs> So we're going to need two people just to keep the costumes in even a semi-usable state of repair. We can't tour in a car now, or a van. We need a bus. We can't afford a good bus. It's going to be a shit bus. We're going to need two more people to help us poorly maintain the bus. We're always going to be hungry now. There's 18 of us. We'll never have any money. Even if we get $500, what's that? By the time we pay for all this shit and the, the gas goes on, we'll never, be able, we'll never be able to stay at any promoter's house. There's 18 of us. Yeah, let's do that. That's why war still exists, isn't it? Right? It's, it's, yeah. I don't know how to express the poetry of understanding the situation and doing the opposite. But that's obviously what they did. So how many people in Slipknot? How many people in my band pig face? 300. <laughs> we can bring the accountants in. We're going to make twice as much money. How is that? Well, we'll fire half of the people in the band. We'll bring us the band. What the hell? You need to make cool shit. <laughs> Up until this point, you've just been making crap. I forgot that word. <laughs> oh, make cool shit. Exactly. Here's some cool shit. Let's have some three. 1972. Two. An album with a spinning circle with these die cut holes. And if a person was on drugs, perhaps they could hypnotize themselves. <laughs> Unbelievable, isn't it? How much did that cost? I'm sure there was a meeting at the label. Fuck! The aging plant to come in, there's a circle that spins around. But I bet in that business meeting, they didn't have a column on the spreadsheet for sales 35 years down the line. And that's still selling. Not just because of the packaging, it's a great album. Combination of great packaging with a great uh, musical product. This is the first album I played on, the Metal Box Public Image Limited. It's three 12 inch singles in a metal film canister with the band's logo and most in the lid. It got good reviews and bad reviews, as albums do. But then it got some national press in the UK. These punk rock kids got into a fight. The fight spilled out into the street, across the gardens. The police were called, ambulances were called. Big headlines in the paper. They were making a hash brownie. <laughs> in the lid of the album, <laughs> as you do. <laughs> and we got into a fight over who got the piece in the middle with the PIL logo on. <laughs> so I'm not guaranteeing you if you go the extra mile with the packaging of anything that you're involved with, that you'll get a reaction like that. But I will guarantee you that if you don't, you won't. Interestingly enough, um, I went out to, to meet with Dan Wyden of Wyden and Kennedy. And as the plane landed, 
So this was 1979, I met Dan two years ago. As the plane landed, I, I read the Wall Street Journal like once a year, I pick up this thing, they chose Metal Box as one of the top five packaged albums of all time. It didn't make me any more money, put a nice little spring in my step as I walked into Dan's office. Pretty cool. This is Shogun Konitoki's Make It Yourself Handheld Battery Powered Strobe Light Kit. And you make that, you have to watch a YouTube video and you burn your fingers and you have to stand by the cat litter box for a day because the cat eats one of your LEDs. And, <laughs> and then you, you make it to, and this is how you experience their album. You fire up your handheld battery powered strobe light kit and experience their music. It's a little bit like Les Lacan 3, isn't it? $69. These guys are from Denmark. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. I saw these guys <coughs> at South by Southwest. I'm like, whoa! And they were playing outdoors, which is good because they smelled really bad. Um, oh, this is amazing. Where did you get these bags printed? This is really cool. And they laughed at me, opened up another bag, which is completely different. Opened up the rear door of the vehicle, is the bass player. <laughs> 15 minutes a bag. And I still remember what it says. Uh, we're hungry, our dogs are hungry, Steve is teaching me to play the violin, we like drugs and group sex, can we stay at your house? <laughs> no. <laughs> but you see the, the impact of, I don't know what those things are called on a typewriter, not the keys, but the arm hammers. I don't you can see the impact of those on the paper. So these discs in these bags vibrate with the energy of this bag. It's all completely It's not about economy of time. Right? You can write a check to disc makers and have two or three thousand digipacks arrive here ten days from now. It's not about that. It's not about sterile shrimp wrapped stuff. It's about <coughs> mixing your DNA and uh, this vibe. Do. It's not time or cost effective. Well, it was cost effective for them to do because they, they had time and didn't have money. But I took those bags all over the world. The girls at the Cologne Institute of Modern Music who translated, if you think you're fuck, you're not, if you could put me, right? And passed those bags around. <coughs> so I'm taking those all over the world. Um, when I went to China, um, I borrowed an idea from some punk rock bands, actually a punk rock band called The Undertones. Um, I bought these posters from the Cultural Revolution and folded them to make a cover for a seven inch single. And so there's 42 different posters, there's 42 different covers for this red vinyl seven inch single. It's not my idea, that was The Undertones. They had a single called Teenage Kicks in 1979. Um, and they just folded up a poster. So I just, this is just one of the crayons I digested and shit out, right? <laughs> um, and then I did this. Scratch and sniff blueberry on the front. Anybody have a knife? Uh oh, I'll watch that. <laughs> Sorry, I think I've got it. So you can open that one. It's not my single. <laughs> scratch and sniff. What's it sound like? It's fucking scratch and sniff blueberry. That's what it sounds like. <laughs> I'll show you, I, I, maybe I'll just hold this up and show you this because it gets kind of crazy. Um, this is a guy called Moldover. M-O-L-D-O-V-E-R. And the song titles of his album are written in circuitry <coughs> on the back of his album. <coughs> Thank you. 
I know what you're saying, I know what you're thinking. Not another light sensitive theremin built into a case <laughs> with a headphone. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to pass this out because there's a lot of you. And uh, as you realize, I'm just horrifyingly ADD. The last thing I need is a bunch of flashing lights and theremin noises. What? <coughs> But, so I called this guy out, Mulder, he came to speak at my school. It's fucking awesome. Oh, stop. <laughs> well, you know, I'll fuck it, I'll pass it around. Okay. Um, just make sure it comes back to me at the end, otherwise I'll kill you all. <laughs> um, so I called him out, I'm like, how's it going? He's like, oh, 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 oh. He sold 500 of them. He sells it for $50 a piece. And so yeah, do the math, $25,000. You know how long it would take me to make $25,000 from a major label release or an independent? It's never, ever, ever, never, never, ever, never, ever, never, 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 Hey, that's great. <laughs> but that's his Great Wall of China, isn't it? He didn't get everything together before he did it. It just kind of exploded a little bit. Now all of his friends in San Francisco are helping him. Well, what are we doing this weekend? Well, put down that syringe, pick up that sofa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, San Francisco. <laughs> We're all going on to crazy mold in this house. He's so, oh, fucking, oh, fucking hell, mold of it. So we're helping him with this ridiculous crusade. But he's done something else that's really amazing to me. I'm not his publicist. I'm not his agent. I'm not his manager. I'm not his record label. I'm just in Brazil. I was just in Brazil. <laughs> Norway, UK, oh, go on, I'll go on, talking about my shit, oh, Moldova, Moldova, Moldova. A student at, um, well, a student at Drexel in Philadelphia said, yeah, but this is a gimmick. Well, it's not a gimmick. If that was Madonna's nipple, and every time you press a nipple, the light goes off, that's a gimmick. This is this guy. He is this guy. He thought, he's on YouTube, standing on a bus, playing this thing to people. It's not a gimmick. And I don't know how much it costs him to make these things, maybe $15. If it cost $50 to make it, we sold for $50. It's still a triumph. He's getting other people to spread. This is the definition of viral, isn't it? You can't make something viral, something becomes viral, and he's becoming viral. I'm sure some of you will check out his website after this. He builds like amazing uh, Everton Live controllers from uh, arcade game parts. He's a really interesting guy. So, let me bring this all together. I'm in my basement, screen printing, scratching, snip, seven inch. Hey, here we go. Hold on a minute, Martin. You're 50 fucking years old. You've got four kids in record level in the book. And you're down in the basement, bringing scratch and sniff. Grow the fuck up. <laughs> then I hear that Starbucks has spent millions of dollars researching the flavor of scratch and sniff they could put on copies of USA Today newspapers that go underneath hotel room doors, underneath the sticker, just in case you're allergic that would cause people to spend more money at Starbucks. <coughs> you know what flavor is? Blueberry. <laughs> wow. Then I hear there's a politician in Korea, whenever he arrives to give a speech, they release a smell into the auditorium to reinforce his message. Quite how you know they've re released a smell in Korea, I, I don't understand. But well, the olfactory sensors, the olfactory sensors are the, the, the uh, deep 
deepest, most effective pathway into the brain, more so than, than seeing or hearing. Right? So I'm like, okay, then I hear that Omni International Hotels has spent millions of dollars and a lot of time copywriting or whatever it is you do with the smell uh, for their hotel lobby. It's a little bit ginger, a little bit lemongrass, a little bit holly. <laughs> so I tell myself to fucking pour gasoline on my own creative spot and follow it wherever it's going. Because people say you have to be passionate about something to succeed in it. Like, I think that's true a while ago. I think now, with all the information on the internet, you have to be curious. If you're curious, you can get any information you need in 10 seconds. If you're not curious, you're not going to get the information. And that's the end of that. So, what's the, the business of this stuff that I'm doing? Well, I'm selling a book. But I'm not, am I? Because if you don't have any money for the book or if you want to pretend hard enough that you don't, <laughs> you can take an e-book. You're burning the fires of hell. <laughs> if you give it 25 cents, you've got a bag full of money. But you can do that. So I kind of fucked up my ability to sell books. Okay, we're monetizing the space around the thing we used to sell. This asshole is going to sell blueberry muffins. <laughs> no. Actually, no, I'm not selling blueberry muffins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Ik dacht, oh, wat al, ik heb mijn vind. Very dry. Very dry. Maybe I'll have like little souvenir, two small plastic cups with freezing cold milk. Fifteen dollars. <laughs> I don't know, I haven't, really, haven't got that part of it together. Maybe what's going to happen is any time you encounter blueberry muffins from now on, you buy a copy of my book. <laughs> like, fuck, it's nine. We've got nine copies of his book. It's great. <laughs> I don't need nine copies. I don't know. But I'm, I'm experimenting. I'm, I'm traveling wherever this shit leads me. You know? um, I'm enjoying the experiment wherever it leads. That's my shit. <laughs> To book to them, and um, so I researched a little bit about the company. And instead of complaining, I just sent a really nice package with the, my China seven inch and scratch and sniff, and seven inch of my book and some of my documents and some other stuff to Dan White. And I thought, well, why don't you start a relationship with him? And if it comes up in the conversation, I'll say, yeah, your Shanghai office blows. I figure if one of you guys was to send a package to Dan White, you'd probably spend weeks on it, right? Mm -hmm. Font. What font we're going to use? I've got there. <laughs> <laughs> it's day nine. We're, we're going to have this font nailed at the end of day ten. It's on the, There's a flow chart. And, yeah. Paper. Oh god, what kind of paper? Oh, oh my god. Well, I bought an old typewriter. I absorbed that lesson from that band at some place. I put some types on the back. And I type really horrifyingly on a piece of scrumbled up paper. Made lots of mistakes with X, 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 X. Because you can't lose a mistake when you use an old typewriter. I deliberately moved the, the roller thing so that the words were all over the place. I tore the end off of the, the paper, scrumbled it up again, and I signed it in broad carpenter's pencil on top of a concrete block so the pencil kept going through the paper. I threw it in a box. So it was like, it was the punk rock, completely free expression of a package I wanted to send to somebody. And I forgot that I'd sent them a package. I don't mean to sound blasé. But I'm driving, I did an event out at the airport in Chicago and I'm driving back and my phone rings, hey, Martin, it's Dan Wyden. I'm like, yeah. Who? <laughs> 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 that one, Wyden and Kennedy. I'm like, yeah, and you, and this is, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> and, then, uh, it's, and now I know, 
right? <laughs> um, and we started talking, and uh, he flew me out to Portland just to hang out. I spent a few hours with John Jay, the head of something there, <laughs> and had lunch. Dan and I had lunch together. Like, we walked to his favorite restaurant, which I'm not going to tell you the name of. And uh, he just come out, it was really great. In fact, I just emailed him this morning and said, hey, I'm welcome. Let you know the brand center today. Um, so that came about because I just let go of some stuff and I didn't care. It's also that, isn't it? It's like taking something into another area. It's finding a way through a door. If that was a really important door, but I, if I thought I was knocking on, it turns out I was knocking on a really important door. But if I thought it was, I might have just like, damn. I needed to set fire to that door. And so it was by doing that, uh, by changing the context, by sending my package to somebody in an area I wasn't interested in exploring, that I got a fantastic, very interesting life fueling result. So anytime you can do that, do that. If you wear a pair of stilts, see-through plastic pants, a purple exploding bra, wings, and a wig to Times Square, New Year's Eve, no one's going to pay any attention, are they? You wear that shit to the library. <laughs> That's it. That's what we're doing. We're wearing see-through pants and stilts to the library. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you ever going to do that eBay auction again where you uh, like have a track produced or engineered by Martin Adams? Uh, I, experiment. I, I, I thought that eBay was really punk rock and de democratizing for that. Anybody who's got 50 to $500 <laughs> wants me to play drums on a track. Well, all right, you know. Um, but I haven't done that in a while. Well, you want me to play drums on something? Yeah, I do. Yeah. All right, we'll take get my card. And we have an interesting package in my studio right now, which is two and a half days. I'll produce three or four or five songs with you. You get two different t-shirt designs, 20 shirts of each design, and 100 discs, it's $13.99. Uh, plus, I think we'll do a little bit of video for you, chop together a video, so you can leave with the tools to sell the 40 shirts and the 100 discs, which pays for the weekend. And you can come back eight weeks later and do it again, and incrementally, break by brick, work towards your goal of having 16 or 18 songs to choose an album from, but instead of wasting 18 months gradually working up to that perfected, seemingly perfected album, which this is because you haven't had all these people throughout the process, um, we start the process early and monetize it for bands as they go through it, which is an interesting idea. Am I done? Yes.